I will just say, you know, welcome to the spring, um, uh, spring ATS summit, uh, 2020. Okay. So let me use my keyboard cause it's using the mouse. seems like it's flipping around quick. So we have some new committers. Um, uh, David Cav Cavalera. Is that how you pronounce his last name? Calavera. Calavera. Um, Valentine. And how do you pronounce your last name, Valentine? So, hi. It would be uh, Valentin Valentin Gutierrez. Gutierrez. Okay. And then Brian Olson. Right. And then Walt. Um, how, do you, how do you pronounce Brian, Brian? Brian. <laughs> but he spells it wrong. Um, let's see. So Yay. just what, Yay. What? Yay. what was that? Stop for the committer. The new yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so Apache Way. Um, I've been talking about this. Uh, I think every summit for the last quite a few summits. Have other companies approve your PRs. Now we get three exclamation marks on it. Um, <laughs> There's been a lot of PRs lately, even since the last summit, of people in the same groups approving um, the same PRs. And it's, it's, I, I feel like we're not sharing enough architecture and knowledge of the code um, and having enough people actually question the design and stuff on things. Um, and I think Leif is going to cover this more in his next talk. Um, so GitHub, I sent out an email on Sunday about moving over to Squash and Merge. Um, so I'll be removing the other two features. Unfortunately, this makes it so that the committer is GitHub. Um, so if you actually want to see who actually pushed the button, you have to go back into Git, which kind of sucks, but it's just the way it is uh, overall. But then that way we won't get these multiple commits um, when someone does a merge, which makes it very difficult for the release manager because what we do is we do cherry picks into the release branches. Um, we want to talk about, we've talked about this, I think briefly before, about using tags for the release instead of milestones. Um, I don't know if you wanted to cover it in this talk or we want to talk it, about it in the next talk, Leif. Um, I don't know. Is there any thoughts? I, you know, does anybody really care or not? So this is GitHub tags, um, yes. not Git tags. This would be GitHub tags. So what okay. we would do is we would, and so that way we can actually set a PR to be on multiple branches. So you can say, so, so, so you can tag it, sorry. So you can tag a PR for multiple releases, I should say. So you'd say, okay, it's gonna be on the nine release. It's gonna be on the eight release, you know, eight, eight dot O dot, you know, whatever, eight release. Um, you can set all that stuff. I think that's probably gonna end up being better in the long run. Yeah, I, I, I saw this I, is what I, I think it would be a lot worse, but okay. okay. <laughs> Why do you think? Because the milestones have certain semantics to them in the system. For example, you can make release notes out of it. Like on the web page, you can click on a milestone, you can get, you can see what's open on this milestone, what's closed on this milestone, and those sort of things. That's true. Is there a way to do that with tags? Well, you can do searches and stuff on tags too, right? It's just, I mean, you can click on a tag and you can see it the same way. It's just, they, 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 and they, you put release dates on milestones, you put, you can close a milestone, you can say this one was closed on this date when we released it. And it, it I, I mean, I, we talked about this and I'm so yeah. many times, Brian, you and I, yeah. it's a sucks, it sucks really bad that, that there's only one milestone per PR, but yeah, yeah, and well, when I, the discussions I've seen on GitHub about that is they say, oh, well, you, milestones are more for development cycles, and then you know you should use tags if you want to do it, re, you know, multiple releases. That's what their um, suggestion was, and maybe they were just suggesting that because they didn't want to add the feature <laughs> or that their database doesn't support it or something. <laughs> um, so they just kind of push it off into that and say use tags. Um, I believe OpenSSL uses tags for their multiple versions. Um, so, seems like I'm seems like you're against it, Life. No, I mean I'm I'm minus zero on it. Meaning, well, well, let's go ahead and let's let's. So the so the worries that you have are what release notes. Yeah. Well, the sort of whole process around. I use the milestone fairly often to click on and see and whatnot. 
Mm-hmm. It's easy. I mean, they all have numbers, right? It's easy to go to milestone 18 and know yep. that's called yep. milestone 18, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I think we should talk about it more okay. and, and see what the implications would be. Okay. Well, I think what we need to do is just kind of list your worries and see if there's mitigation for each one of those. And if there isn't, or, you know, if we're willing to live with it or not. And the other thing is, is I think essentially we would have to implement those, those things that you can do in milestones today. You would have to make saved searches or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And then I think that the thing is, is if we go to milestones, or sorry, if we go to tags, how hard would it be going back from tags back to milestones? You know what I'm saying? Because I just don't want it like a one-way road. Like we can't like go back. It's like, wait, this sucks. You know, we did it for 10, the experiment failed. Let's go back. And for the next release, let's go back to milestones. Well, uh, Git, GitHub has an API, right? Yeah, yes. but even so you can do this in the UI too, though. You can very easily select all well, it's easy, but you can select all PRs with a certain label, yep. and then you can set the milestone for all of those. Yep. You, can do, you can do these mass changes in the UI fairly easy. The, the only problem I see with, with going down, because we would have a PR with multiple tags on it, yeah. you, you are, you're, both, you're basically stuck. Yep. Because you know. if you want to go ahead and put a milestone on that later, you can only choose one. Um, I mean, one, one option which gets really wonky, right, is that you have the primary milestone as the milestone and then back ports goes as labels. Yeah. Well, it's really, I think we ought to leave it mostly to release managers because frankly, it doesn't matter. If you're not a release manager, I don't see this matter. You just do what you're told. Well, no, I, I agree with that, but also I, I have some slides coming up here when I'm gonna flog everyone and uh, essentially <laughs> beating you into submission here to actually use the tools correctly. Because not even you, Alan, can use the GitHub tools correctly. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> most most people do. Yeah, need their uh, need to work on how they go ahead and do things. Everyone like needs a flogging. Yep. I even I screw up once in a while. Right, and that's also what we're trying to achieve here, right? Some of the, the suggestions that, that, that Brian is making, and and uh, like for example, this whole squash and merge. That's to, to minimize the how easy it is to screw things up on GitHub. Yep. Okay. Also, I think we pro- might need to do some of the things. GitHub has abilities to automatically do like set milestones and stuff like that. We might want to start looking at doing some of that. Like if it's a you know if it's a PR towards master, then set the default milestone for the next you know major release or something like that. We do that. I think you can. I, I'm not a GitHub expert, but I think you can do some of that stuff. Part of the complication too is that we don't have full ownership of our Git repository. So yep. oftentimes Brian would have to contact the uh, ASF infra to make make any of these changes, like changing it to Squash and Merge. You can't do that change, right, Brian? I can now. We have the dot files that actually that was the whole dot file spamming the mailing list. Okay. So actually inside of there, we can actually set the options for GitHub. For everything? Uh, I don't know exactly what what capabilities they give us or not. I haven't looked at it. All I knew is I I used it for stopping the spamming. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good news. That means we can do more of these things than without... Yes, without money. involving them. Yep. Yeah. And we have the ability also um, to create our own repos. I can, I, we can create our own repos on the fly too that are associated with Traffic Server. Mm-hmm. We don't have to go through Infra or anything. There's a tool that we can just do. And I did that for, uh, for Kit and the Kubernetes stuff for the Ingress controller. So if anybody needs a repo or something you know, for, that's associated with our project, um, it's really easy for me to create. So just throwing that out there. Um, fall summit, um, for those who went, uh, there was, um, well, there was, uh, 73 attendees and we hosted it Verizon media hosted it and it was in Sunnyvale. Um, that's a picture of, um, a couple pictures of when we went out to dinner. Um, so since the last summit, um, these are some things six, I said six ish releases because we've had four, but we're doing another release tomorrow. Um, so, and those are the version numbers. 
We had four CVEs. Um, generally, so we had the interesting the the last two on this list were actually the bug bounties from Verizon Media. So we paid to to get those um, to identify those, and then um, Yahoo Japan and I think uh, Missouri. Was that yours? The, uh, if Missouri's on, I think he did the slow to read attack. Um, so last quarter, some stats. So this is the only really bad stat that we had um, looking at all of the information is that, um, so that's why I put it first. So that way we have all the good stats after this, um, is uh, the number of issues. So we're not closing out issues. Um, very well, they're just accumulating. Um, as you can see, over quarter over quarter, we're just, we just keep accumulating issues. So Leif and I will probably have to go through and do a issue scrub and close out a lot of stuff. Um, well, what would really help here again is that people, and I, I think everyone knows this, but if you put in a comment in your commit message saying this closes pound one, two, three, four, then issue pound one, two, three, four will be closed automatically. And it automatically that, gets That's a minor thing to do in your PRs would help so yeah. much. Yeah, that, that's the thing is I think, I was thinking about this is like the mi one minute or the two minutes that it takes to go ahead and do something on your PRs or on a GitHub pull request saves, can save hours or weeks of another developer's time, um, such as like, associating a PR with a, another PR that actually fixes a bug and stuff like that. And these are, you know, it may take like a minute to do, but it's, it, it really saves a lot of people's time. Um, yeah, so that's a clarification question here. Um, are we saying right now, I thought we might have said this, but I'm not clear on this. Um, should all PRs have an issue associated with them? No, they don't have to. Should they? Uh, I agree that it's optional. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, we're all adults here mostly. And, uh, yeah, except we, that you're we, flogging us because we're not using Git properly. And so well, the question, do we need, do we need to have issues stating what the problem is before we have PRs to fix them? I think if you put the good description in the PR, you don't I, need the issue. I, I agree with Alan. I, I mean, I, I see what Jen, Jason is getting at, right? The, the sim, simplifying the, the process. Mm -hmm. Well, the workflow uh, minimizes the amount of, of shit show, right? So by, by, by enforcing a certain workflow and a process, you can minimize some of these problems. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't really care which way we go with it. I'm just saying that I've seen other projects which say, you know, when you take a look at their release logs, everything's a PR. Yeah. There's no, oh, I just had a refactor. I fixed something. Everything's an issue. Everything is directed at something that is, you know, Measurable. Um, yeah, we we, just, we used to you know, some quick fix. Yeah, we used to do that with Jira. We required when we were in Jira, we required that you have you know create an issue um, there. When we switched over to GitHub, we said you know you you don't have to. We could revisit that. I'm I'm okay with that either way. It does create a little bit more work, you know. I, I'm torn on it too. I can go either way, honestly. I, I, I think part of the reason why we decided to not do this is that the, the PRs essentially look like issues already. Yep. Yeah. Just I mean, issue with code. Yeah. The only reason I'm raising is because, you know, the question for me is how do we mitigate, you know, Zoop's upsetness about no one following any process? So um, well, maybe uh, you change I'm, the process to make Zoop happy. I'm always going to be unhappy and upset. So that's <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we just say ignore, just ignore you, and yeah, whatever. No, uh, you, can make, you can make me less upset and less unhappy. So, yes, so something, I, something that I I've been um, uh, following. I, I don't know if this is right or wrong. Is that if uh, if I already have a fix for an issue that I'm going to report, I would skip the issue. I would just go ahead and run a PR and describe the issue and put the fix. But if I don't have a fix and I know there's a problem, for example, a core dump, and I want to report it, I open an issue. Then there is a problem of inconsistency with an issue open with no PR yet, and someone else might fix it and may not know that the issue is opened by someone else and not close it. That may be contributing to this problem some, to some uh, somewhat. Um, like issues may be opened by people that are not actually fixing those directly and relying on some other 
people's stomachs. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if this is the standard practice, but this is what I've been. Uh, I, I barely used to report issues in the past. I just started reporting them uh, recently. I don't know what others are doing. So what you describe is the workflow that we expect people to do. And in fact, right. there's been a little bit of flogging where we have to remind people, did you file an issue? And then we discuss it in Slack, right? And we say, where's the issue? And, yeah. and there's no issue. And I right. think if anything that, that's really, really critical here is that as you run in and find a problem or have or something, a crash or whatever it might be, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't fix it immediately, like immediately being hours or day, right? File an issue because that way some, they might someone say someone else's time from debugging the same thing and being at a loss for another day, right? So yep. always file an issue if you, if you have a problem and you don't have an immediate change, PR. I mean, a lot of our PRs are done by someone, hey, this is something that I want to change and it's not really an issue per se, right? It's just something I want to change. Okay, so I think it's enough about issues. Um, and if you have, well, one more thing. <laughs> um, if you have a whole bunch of open issues, go through them, make sure that you close them out. Um, you know, since you filed them, um, you're kind of the owner of them. You should be closing them out um, if they've got fixed. And you can certainly find, it's easy to find your own issues and your own PRs. I think the sentence is, is author colon and your username, I think. Yeah. Um, down. Yeah, there is. And then, so on the number of PRs, um, we've been doing good on that. I mean, we closed more than we opened. Uh, I think we stayed pretty even on that. Um, we stayed pretty consistent on uh, opening versus closing. Uh, and there's 298 in the last 90 days or so. And then also another thing that increased were the code contributors. Um, so that increased by 41% and the number of commits increased by 30%. Commits are kind of, I think that takes it across all branches. So when we're doing cherry picks and stuff like that, that'll be in there. That's why the number of commits is much higher than the number of uh, PRs. What time span PRs. is the, this time is, the code contributors over? This, Ever? no, this is uh, quarters. So I'm looking back at the last quarter. Okay. That's, um, this, these are all quarterly numbers. That's how um, the tools for Apache, they look at projects. Um, interesting. Uh, is the busiest GitHub PRs um, enforce active? I just thought this was interesting. Enforce active connection limits. Um, 15 comments on that. Um, uh, and then busiest email threads, remap plugin, DSO reloading. Enabling and disabling. <laughs> and then also there was another interesting one was get me off this list, nine emails. <laughs> <laughs> that was when uh, the spam email was occurring. Um, so next summit, those are my cats. And we just got those uh, a couple weeks ago. And next summit, um, like I said, most likely remote. And should we do more hackathons? Um, yeah, I was thinking you might want to go quarterly and, and have half summits and half hackathons. I know that people, yeah, I know people were interested in hackathons. More ha hackathons? No? Yes? Maybe just getting together and saying, okay, this is what it's on our, what are, what were the PRs that we're running internally and trying to get those into branches? Yeah, I think you're going to be better off making the hackathons like one day or half a day and having them more frequently. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I mean, I was positively surprised to the last hackathon. And calling it a hackathon is a little bit of a misnomer almost. Yeah, that's, it's why more I, of a, that's why I put quotes. Let's get all our, our cats in the same room so we can herd them in the right direction. Exactly. Yes. And I think it worked well, but I mean, I'm, uh, if people, I might be an exception here, but I, I would rather do it say every month or every six weeks or something like that. And then like you said, Alan, do it half a day. It's much easier to schedule that way and we can, and then we can do it like semi-regularly. Okay. It's something we talked about like a number of years ago yep. as well to do these sort of monthly sync up. Yep. And that got shut down because someone from uh, ASF shot on it and said, yep. you can't do that because it's not inclusive. Yeah. 
Well, all decisions will still have to go to the mailing list. Right? And that's kind of the Apache way of doing things is that it doesn't, it, yeah, unfortunately, we can't decide things unless it goes to the mailing list. No, but that's so always too, been the case, right? Then it's, yeah. I mean. So meetups too often are not inclusive because of time zone selections? Stuff like that. It's, it's just yeah. that the Apache way was essentially any any formal meeting has to be in mailing list only or maybe IRC channel in certain time slots or whatever it was. Or you could, it was weird. It was very strange. And I think now because things have changed and now everyone is able to do, this was like probably like five, six years ago we had yeah. we tried this, right, Brian? Yep. Now everyone is more sort of like this working from home scenarios, being remote, being different time zone. It's sort of for good or for worse, something we all had to deal with for, for the last three months and probably going forward. And I think it's a golden opportunity to just sort of, let's do this and see what, and not even give it an option to say no. Yeah. Because even within the, the company, like at Apple, we're not meeting anymore either face to face, right? So we can do our own, but that's worse. I think having Apple doing their meetings on, on ATS development and then having Verizon doing their meetings on ATS development is worse than having all, all of us combined together, in, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think we definitely need to sync up and f figure out where we're at on all of our releases and stuff like that and what bugs we're seeing and, and what PRs are running internally and things like that. And also, I think what we should do then, if we, if we do this, is take the opportunity to, because I still feel that oftentimes, and this applies to everyone, even even VJ's team, is that we sort of develop in a, in a, in a vacuum, right? We, we do a lot of work inside the, the corporations, and then once it's done or, or getting close to done, then it gets discussed in the, in, mm -hmm. in the, in the community. And, and clearly it should be the other way around. Right? First, we should discuss, hey, here's what I think we should do. I want to do this. I want to change. I want to do pre-warming of, of server session pools. What do you guys think about that? How are we going to do that? And then we go and implement it. Yep. That, that seems like a much healthier approach to, to moving forward in, in no matter what people think on, on, on the. Yeah. And we try to, to stress that by saying, you know, Hey, create an issue, send something to the mailing list. If you have design, you know, so that way you don't write something, throw it out there and then it basically gets negative ones and then you wasted all your time. Um, but I think also having like a forum to do that in where we're meeting face to face to talk about things like that would be, be helpful too. Cool. I think that's all I had on my slides and I am